How are you? My name is Wayne Kranz, and I'm sitting here with three of the largest guitar players in America right now. And I'm very, very pleased to be doing that. These guys are incredible. I'm here to ask them some questions. Uh, about... Wait a minute. No? No, we're here to ask each other questions. Thanks for hanging here today. We'll make this as interesting as possible. Um, who wants to start? I vote, I vote Bob starts. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. We're looking at the phones. Yeah, it's good. You're sound has evolved so much over the years, that, you know, as a player, as an improviser, the sound of your bands, um, even your tone and everything. Um, so, I, I mean, I was just curious, you know, do you, is that is that more of a conscious thing, or is it just an organic, natural thing that's just grown naturally? That's a great question. Um, I think it's maybe both. I think some, some artists, not just musicians, but artists, they tend to uh, consolidate what they do over the years. They find something that they want to focus on and then they refine it. And so it just kind of becomes, it doesn't really change much uh, in, in big ways, but in small ways it becomes more detailed and proficient and, uh, and expressive maybe, hopefully. Uh, and then other people in all the arts, they tend to kind of be on more of some kind of journey through their their thing. And um, and I guess for me, it's been more like that. And I, I could say it's because I admire artists that do that. Like I'm thinking like mostly painters that do that. That kind of go through periods and, and uh, move from point A to point B, from beginning to end. And, I just like that. I'm attracted to it, and um, so that's part of it. And the other part of it would be just like, you know, as far as the sound, I don't want to get too nerdy here, but I started off using a sound that was very common among my peers. And uh, at some point when I wanted to try to make something more personal, I realized I was going to have to get rid of that sound just because it was the sound of the day. And so that kind of forced me into a corner of like, well, what else could I do, you know? And so I got rid of two amps and stereo everything and just went one amp, turned up all the way, no effect. And it sounded quite horrible, actually, for a while. Maybe still even till today, honestly. I mean, judging by the gig last night, I can say it's, it still happens. But, uh, but it, it, you know, it sort of forced me to kind of figuring out a different way to do it. And the other thing that I want to say quickly is I started off with my groups by writing a lot, by composing a lot. Um, for the band, and as I as we started, that was great for the records. But as we started to play it live, I realized that for us, a good gig, like the best gig we could have, would be a gig where we didn't screw it up. You know, where we played the parts correctly. And the real fun of it was actually the stuff that wasn't scripted, that was more spontaneous. And when I got in touch with that being more fun as a performer. That led me to more improvising, and so that cycle happened from being super composed to now, which there's actually very little composition happening, at least on the in the trio, in the live thing that I do, and, and KCL, this thing I'm doing here later today. KCL trio. How's the music come about for this music? Yeah, it. Uh, hey, Brett. Uh, it used to be, uh, when we started, we rehearsed once a week, um, and I was writing there every, every week some new stuff, and we were learning how to improvise, because when we started playing, we started a more improvisational thing, it sounded terrible, it sounded really boring, and, and we realized that we needed to figure out how to make it sound better for the audience, and, uh, and so we used to rehearse, as I say, once a week for that, just kind of having ideas about how to make improvisation more dependable, less kind of, you know, up to the gods happening to smile down on you that day. 
which we found out they don't smile that often. They're not smiling a lot. You know, they're, they're distracted. They have other things to do. I don't know what it is, but uh, which is okay for us because we're jamming and that's fun to do. But for an audience, you know, to come and pay and be uncomfortable and drive and eat and all those things that audiences have to do, it was a lot to ask. So we figured out ways to try to make it more fun for them, more consistently so that it could be more of a professional thing. And that took some rehearsal. But this particular band, KCL, hasn't been playing at all for many years. We just did a gig, I think, last year. We did one, and it ended up being fun, you know, because we all loathed each other and couldn't stand being. It's like a Keith and Mick kind of situation. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not that bad, actually. But, they, you know, everybody just got busy. Um, but uh, it was fun, and so we're now we're doing this thing. And we had one hour long two hour long rehearsal. I tried to write some music for it, just because I thought along the lines of, hey, let's have some movement here. Let's not just redo what we did. So I tried to write some stuff, and that didn't go that great. A couple of things ended up being kind of workable, and so we're gonna play those today, but uh, but not not too much rehearsal. Re rehearsal is kind of a luxury, really. I find, you know, like when I hear about bands, I get to rehearse for weeks and months. I just. I just envy it, you know? It just must be great, because you can really get detailed with stuff. But uh, we're primarily winging it. But I mean, we got, we started playing together, I don't know. I think it was in the late 1800, around 1865 we started. And uh, so there is some, you know, kind of like we sort of know some something about each other at this point. Yeah, go ahead, man. You were talking about making, trying to make it more fun for the audience and, and wondering what some of the elements that you're rejecting are and how do you avoid like dumbing it down in the process? Uh, let's see. Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of things that we do. I, I don't... Uh, let's see, what's the quick answer? It's, it's, a, it's, it's like a creative challenge. Like, how do you make it more interesting for the audience? That turns into a challenge. It turns into a, a creative act to figure out how to organize the improvising in a way so that it's not just random jamming. Like, I don't know if you can relate to this, but a lot, a lot of times when people jam, which is kind of what we do, uh, it's, it's kind of formless and shapeless and um, sort of random sounding. I mean, sometimes it can be incredible, you know, it can be the best stuff ever sometimes, but to try to make that more consistent, which was kind of how to make the audience enjoy it more, involve things like establishing forms, but I'm trying to get to get too detailed about it, but forms that we use, it's not just an open jam, it's a jam that has form. Like if you play us, I hope this isn't too nerdy, if it is, just say, shut up, move on. Um, when you play a song, if you play a song, there's a form that that song has, and if you improvise with the song, you improvise with that form. And what that does is it puts it in a container that humanity understands, because humanity understands form. That's what they hear in music. It's in all the music we love. It's in every pop tune. It's like, here comes the chorus. Like, that feeling involved is, is determined by what the form of the song is. So. If you're jamming formlessly, it's harder to imitate composition, which is kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to make something that sounds like it could have been written, maybe. It's that strong. Um, and to do that, it turned out, we realized, we understood after a while, that form was going to be one of the answers to that. And we used the simplest, 4, 8, 16 bars, the simplest possible Western forms, because um, not that anybody knows that or anything when they hear it necessarily, but we hope that it kind of gives an underlying organization to the thing that somebody can subliminally relate to and make it easier to connect with. Plus it allows us to direct the improvising while we're doing it. Like I can cue things, movement, you know, we're gonna change to a different song now, we're going to go to a different tempo now, we're going to drop, somebody's going to drop out, we're going to get quieter, whatever. 
Uh, I don't have to cue getting louder. That seems to happen all by itself. But, but quieter it does need to be cued. You know, think cues like that are possible if there's some kind of container or form that we can use to say, okay, the beginning of the next phrase, it's going to be X. So you can kind of direct the improvising that way, which can make it less boring. Like, I believe that movement is really change is what keeps things interesting. I mean, unless you're intentionally, as an artist, doing something that doesn't have that. If you're doing it artistically, that's one thing. You know, to do an ambient thing as an artist, that's totally valid. And in that situation, maybe there wouldn't be any change. But for us, anyway, uh, even if it's like my favorite time to move on is when it's killing, when it's just unbelievably good. Because I love getting out before it dies. And, and I remember when we first started, and I first started realizing that, people would be angry with me. They would come out of the audience and say, man, why did you get out of that thing? And, you know, they just didn't understand. <laughs> But, uh, but that kind of that kind of thing, you know, it's it's. I just feel really uh, honored that somebody is willing to listen to us improvise. Like, I have no pretension about that at all. It's it's like this could be a disaster. It could be just the worst thing ever, you know. And, and people are down. Some people are down to give it a chance. And I I don't take that lightly at all. So I'm constantly trying to think about like what can we do to kind of guarantee that this doesn't that if it's bad, it's still good enough to listen to. Like that's kind of the goal to get the the low level of it high enough so that it's still credible as entertainment of some kind on some level. So. So we're devious with that. We think like it, it's a creative thing. You come up with as many ways to do that as you can. You know, it's cool. A lot of different kinds of people. But the music that you play and that well, you know, we play is like pretty complicated. Like not going to be mainstream. But I guess I'm curious because I I heard that you would start. You wanted to play music from listening to the Beatles. And I think a lot of us. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I read. And a lot of us started. Listening. You can believe everything you. Okay, good. And a lot, I think a lot of us like like pop music. Like presumably, at some point in history, you thought pop music was was pretty okay. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about pop music and where it's gone and where it's going. If you just you're like don't even care, like get out of my life. No, that's cool. I I'm not a huge music listener myself, but I have a 15 year old daughter, so I hear a lot of pop music. And, uh, and I, I, you know, some like particularly on the production end, it's it's so sophisticated and cool and creative. A lot of it, but I really dig that element of it. I do recognize that the music a while back became more groove oriented than melody or harmony oriented. And while there's nothing wrong with that per se, I mean, I'm a big rhythm fan myself. I like balance. I like it when. I, I believe that, that the balance of art, which imitates the balance of nature, um, should be recognized for something to, to sound complete. And sometimes if something is lacking, you know, the, one of the major elements, which are rhythm, melody, harmony, and sound, let's say, music, if there's a kind of music that's ignoring, say, two of those elements, it's really got to kick ass on the other elements to make up for that lack of balance. And sometimes I feel like the pop stuff that I hear anyway, I'm not saying I've heard all of it by any means, but a lot of it doesn't quite do that. And so in that sense, I'm a little not moved so much. But that's just the mainstream. Like, I recognize, fully recognize that on the fringe, on the fringe of every genre out there, there are very, very creative people doing amazing things. Uh, even in so-called pop, you know, I don't really know who they are, but occasionally I'll hear little bits and pieces, and I'm like, "Whoa, that is serious." Yeah. So I think we're we're healthy. I think you know, I think the people are healthy with it. It's just. As usual, like it's been a long time since the best stuff was presented in the mainstream. I mean, that to me, anyway. Kevin, Kevin, I have a question. Don't you guys know each other? Why did I? Why did I see you over in the yoga tent earlier? Stretch it out, bro. Okay. Kevin Scott, ladies and gentlemen. 
its own. Real question that everyone wants to know is hybrid picking. <laughs> yes or no? That's a strong maybe on that one. No, actually, it's funny. I saw. Apparently, I do that. I don't. I don't know. But somebody wrote a book on it and wrote me an email saying, "Hey, I wrote a book on hybrid picking. Maybe you'd be interested in it." So I said, "Yeah, sure. Please, I'll buy it or whatever. Send it over." To me. And so I got the book that describes what I do, and I, I couldn't decipher it at all. I didn't recognize it. I can't do it. So, uh, you know. Yeah, that's what I Don't buy that book, is what you're saying. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Just follow your instincts. Yeah. Um, what do you find inspires you mostly nowadays? And I, I ask that partially because... In, the, in your book, Improvisers OS, there seems to be like a pretty strong spiritual element to it. So I was curious, what what inspires you creatively, improvisationally, even compositionally, in any, any way? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question, hard to answer for me. Uh, I mean, I... For superficial kinds of inspiration, I go to generally dead people, videos of dead people performing. I mean, they're not performing when they're dead, obviously. But back when they were alive, you know, they are all filmed and doing their thing, and there's peak performances from those people. And, uh, Generally, my my sources tend to run towards Black American music, I guess, um, because I just get knocked out by you know as a as a white kid from from a small town in Oregon. I didn't grow up with that, and, and uh, when I heard it, it just made a gigantic impression on me, and, and uh, so that would that would be a place that I would go in music, I guess, for that. Although not exclusively that, I just noticed that. Kind of tend towards that. Um, I can get inspired. This gets boring really fast, but I get inspired by by painting. I get inspired by art, visual art. And uh, like, if a plane happens to be flying by with an advertisement trailing behind it, I can shoot machine guns. Texas Firearms Museum. I find myself looking up to the lock and load. And She's coming to the game tonight. From that, I take inspiration for the, the performance that's going to occur later, which I suggest no one comes to after seeing that sign. Um, but you know, I got I just real quick. Let me just say, there seems to be some kind of uh, inner internal inspiration that I have that's kept me going through the years. Because there's been times when it wasn't, uh, I wasn't getting a lot of that from outside, and so. For some reason, I'm lucky in that way. Like, I can kind of go in uh, for it. Um, and I don't, some of my friends, some of my excellent musician friends seem to rely largely on external inspiration from other musics. And uh, I, I'm always, uh, I always admire that and envy it because there's so much of it. There's so much incredible stuff out there that you can take in. It seems like it would be wonderful to be swimming in a sea of inspiration all the time. But uh, for some reason, I, I don't avail myself of that. Probably to make it harder for myself, but uh, for whatever reason. But uh, but so yeah, I sort of go in, and it's kind of a boring answer. I mean, you guys basically. That's what I'm getting. I'm just. Let me skirt, I'm skirting the issue. You three are where I go today. That's where I'm going to go today. It's a pretty good inspiration. No, that's where I'm going today. It is. That's it. I don't recommend that. Yeah. Let me, why don't, well, we'll flip it on you. Because we're going we're gonna to hang up on you now. So, because what we all got from you, well, one of the many things, was your sense of time and feel. And we're all rhythm guitar players first, but we're also soloists. You have a, I will say, danceable quality to your solo playing, which it's rhythmic and it's intensive and it has, it's like you're playing rhythm guitar while you're playing lead guitar. And that's something that like 
all of us, at least the three of us, are constantly trying to kind of figure out. How did you arrive at that? Was it a conscious choice? Was it something from playing with the trio? Do you play with a lot of percussion? Where did, we're all just trying to figure out how you do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, playing with trio, definitely partly that. Because I think part of what makes stuff groove in a way is, is it's hard to make linear stuff groove. Um, it's hard to make one note at a time, guitar playing, groove. Some people can do it, like some of the, especially some of the jazz guys. Like one of my early inspirations just to think about that, like how can I make the lines groove more was this guy George Benson, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he, he has that danceable quality, like he plays lines and he, it's just like a funk band or something, you know, so when I saw that, I realized I didn't want to imitate it, but I thought it's possible. A human being can play lines and make it danceable, kind of. Um, so that was an inspiration. Uh, but, but then, and so I thought about it that way and tried to do that. But a big part of it, I think, is the fact that I play chords a lot when I, I mean, what, what people would think of as chords when I'm soloing, which I don't even really do, honestly. But whatever it is that we're doing up there, there's a lot of chordal stuff happening. So it's not just like, it's not that. It's da da clang, da do ga da clang, 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 doom, boom, ga ga ch ga da. Da da do ga ga da, gom, 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 ga da ga do, gom, ba da. You know, it's like melody, chords, rests in between. All that stuff creates rhythm. Like rhythm is created by the rests in it. It's not really created by the attack. It's created by the gaps. And linear playing, which most guitar soloists do, doesn't really have many gaps. I mean, sometimes it does, but to the degree that it does, it sounds more rhythmic, I think. And one of the reasons that I turned away from playing linearly, playing lines all the time, because that's a whole thing, you know, especially if you've tried to do it, it's very hard to do. And so once you realize how hard it is to do, you start admiring people that can do it, because it's difficult. And, and so that became a thing. But ultimately, to me, I, I sort of had to turn away from it because it didn't have enough, you know, despite George Benson's accomplishments, which I somehow, you know, surprisingly couldn't quite rise to, um, I needed to turn to some other solution to how do I get more rhythm in there? And it turned into shorter phrases. And it was interesting, I read Miles' autobiography, I don't know if you've read it, Miles, the Quincy Troop thing. He talks about it in there. Like, he, I, was, I was so, I, I felt so affirmed when I read that. Because at the end, I think, he's saying, like, where's music going now? And he said something like, I think it's going towards shorter phrases. And, you know, because I, cause he was coming from long phrase central. He came from the people that defined that, the bebop thing. So he recognized, as the music became more groove-based, that, you know, it wasn't ding, 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 anymore. It was doom, scat, doom, scat. Like all those pauses in there, right? And so the phrases had to be, had to fit with that, too. Doom, scat, doom, scat, dum, go, 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 Like all of a sudden there's room in there for a body to move. And there's room in there for other musicians to inject stuff. And, uh, and so maybe that's why you're proceeding it like that. Um, plus, I'm, again, I don't, don't want to be boring with this, but I'll just mention this because when I realized this, it was interesting to me. Maybe it'll be interesting to you. I realized that in my case anyway, and I, th I think it's this, probably, if I feel it, we probably all do. Um, The thing that inspires, like groove playing that I hear when I'm playing, groove inspires rhythmic playing. Harmony inspires melodic playing. So if I'm playing with something that has chords in it that are shifting, that, that kind of triggers some kind of melodic sense in me, tonal, melodic sense. But if I'm just hearing a beat, it triggers a rhythm response. And so I articulate that rhythm, since we play mostly groove stuff, I articulate that 
you know, with my guitar. I'm a guitar player, I'm not a drummer. So it comes out tonally, it comes out as notes. But it's really me thinking rhythmically and then kind of channeling the rhythm through the notes. And those notes, you know, if you add like chords to that or harmonic playing more than one note at a time, repetition, it can turn into groove, you know. And it's still a solo because you're improvising. You know, it's not it's not lick based. I mean it's that is the soul. Like sometimes sometimes people will ask like why we don't solo and with this band you're gonna see tonight, KCL. Hopefully hope they're gonna come. Um, you know, and I, I sort of don't have the heart to tell them that that's all we're doing. Like all three of us. This guy Kenny Wallison, this great drummer from New York, the first time he heard us play, he, he nailed it. This was long ago, years ago. He said, "You guys were playing Dixieland," and it's true. Like it's three people improvising at the same time, kind of weaving stuff in and out of each other. I mean, you know, obviously different style, but. But that idea, you know, is kind of how we approach it. As opposed to, I'm not saying we never, like, it's not like we never step forward and take a, a solo. We do sometimes, but it's really not about that. That's more the jazz tradition, also the rock tradition, you know. Of like, now it's the guitar solo, now it's the bass solo, now the drummer's gonna... It's like somebody, like on this gig, if somebody says, hey, give the drummer some, it's like we all just laugh. It's like, that's all we're doing. <laughs> hasn't stopped playing since we started playing, you know? So, uh, maybe, yeah, I don't know if that answers. Absolutely great question. It's, it's pretty general, but I was just curious your thoughts on what, uh, like what you might look for in a bass player, or what kind of elements might define a bass player that you would or wouldn't want, whether it's technical or philosophical, whatever comes to mind. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Technical, probably not so much. I mean, what we do does require technique. Like, we sort of have to be good at playing to do what we do, because it's, even though it's, it's really not about that, it's not the focus, uh, as it is in some musics that are related to what we do, the technical part. Um, in our case, it's really a functional requirement, just to be able to kind of play imaginatively in time at various tempos and stuff requires technique. Um, but I think the main thing would be an ability to improvise in a way within the groove that allows movement, that allows uh, evolution in, in, the, in the song that allows somebody who understands how to play creatively and play groove at the same time. And to me, it's not just bass. That's drums, bass, guitar. I think it's everybody. To me, that's the modern thing. The thing right now that we're all, if I were you know, 17 and playing drums, I would be working on being able to groove as heavily as possible and improvise within the context of that groove without sacrificing the groove. It's not easy. It's not an easy thing, but it's a kind of a modern thing. Like, when I first started, there were groove drummers and improvisers. There were funk players and jazz players. And there weren't too many people, there were like a handful of people in the States that I knew of that could, could kind of blur those lines. And because they could, they were be, they became very valuable. Because there's not that many people like that now. You know, now that there's like a music school in every town in America that has a population of over 10,000, you know, with a degree program in contemporary music that hundreds of kids go to all the time, there are literally thousands of people just in this country being exposed to that kind of thinking. Which doesn't mean they can all do it or are interested in it. They're not. But a lot of kids are. And, and, um, and that, I think it's a good thing. I think it's an evolution. I think it's, I think it's what was missing from the transition. You know, I'm no music historian, believe me, but you know, when Miles started playing funk and rock, he kind of went to a thing where the bass and drums, I mean, Dijanel was playing a lot, it's not that they weren't, but still, it was kind of a layered thing with bass and drums playing a funk groove. You know, he hired straight up R&B bass players, not improvisers at the, in the beginning. And then he put jazz soloists on top. So it was this layered thing of groove under here, 
holding down the funk, and then a saxophone player blowing his brain or her brains out or over the top of it, with really no connection between those two things. And that was great, and some of the great music we've ever had is just designed like that, and people still play like that today, and it can still sound great today. But I think a more modern idea would be the kind of thing I'm talking about, where there's some kind of mixture between those things. I remember, I'm reminded of this, I, I spent some time playing with Steely Dan in the 90s, and uh, because they hired, they wanted an improviser for a season, so they hired me, strangely. And, um, and at one point I said, hey, is it okay? Because I was just playing with, the band was completely not improvising as this layer, which sounded like the records. And they wanted me on top improvising with nobody to play with, you know? So I was kind of like, because improvising for me anyway is kind of just some give and take, especially with the drums. And so I asked, like, is it okay if the, if the drummer, who was Ricky Lawson at the time, just kind of like plays a little bit of ride cymbal with me when I'm, when I'm playing? And they said no, because they felt it would compromise the group for the audience. They felt that that little bit of interaction would, would make it less funky for the audience. And I respect that. I understand it. It's just I don't, just, I don't agree with it. I mean, that's not... I, my band is not like that, obviously, if you've, if you've heard it or will hear it. I mean, but again, you know, we have the luxury of not being successful. <laughs> we do. That's a big advantage. That's a huge creative advantage to not be financially, economically, business-wise successful. It's massive. Because we're not trapped. It doesn't matter what we do. It's not like people aren't going to come anymore if we don't do X. We can do whatever we creatively want to do. That's the beauty of it. That's the freedom that we have. You know, there's obvious downsides to not being successful. Believe me, as I'm sure you can imagine. But, you know, so they were to some degree, they play Peg, it's got to sound like Peg, it's got to groove like Peg, and that's the end of the story. So, uh, yeah, why was I saying that? I was saying that, oh, you're asking about bass players. Yeah, somebody that can improvise without taking solos. Like, that's the big confusion. People think improvising means soloing. You know, so people work on their soloing. I'm talking about being able to creatively make groove happen spontaneously. Somebody, you know, we've been on the road for a little while now. We're kind of halfway through our tour, and somebody uh, often asks, how do you remember all those grooves? You know, how do you, how do you keep that in your head? Like, they don't understand that we have nothing in our head. We, we are improvising. We are trying to spontaneously generate grooves that are cool enough, and we don't always succeed, but we try, that are cool enough to be perceived as something that you would remember, you know? Like when I hear that, it's like a compliment. It's like, right on. We won, you know? We, we convinced them, or this, this person or that person, that what we're doing was actually composed. Which, uh, you yeah, know, I think it's a good sign. Yeah. I wish it could happen more often, you know. Hopefully it'll happen today. Depends what kind of cabinet I get. <laughs> I can tell you, I got a cabinet last night and it didn't happen. Woof! Ouch. Still getting over that. I'll be okay. I'll be fine. A couple more hours, it'll just be a distant memory. Everything's gonna be fine. We're learning how to play your instruments, like the stuff you were just talking about, like improvising while grooving, being able to groove, and maybe even more specifically, like displacing time and not losing track of where you are. Is that something that you feel like you spent a lot of time, like really specifically with a metronome, sit down, practice this thing? Was it a little more loose? Was it just something you learn on the bandstand night after night? In terms of keeping your place and stuff, or in terms of the precision? I guess both, just being a rhythmic improviser and and also like, yeah, like displacement. Okay, it's yeah. Like a specific tactic. Right. Like there's so much you can do with rhythm, right? It just doesn't have to be boom, bap. It could be anything. And um, and we, we experiment a lot with that. Experiment isn't the right word. We express ourselves that way by changing it up from boom, bap. With a good dose of boom, bap in there too. Because it, you know, we do want it to groove like that too. But the precision part of it is, I practice with a metronome endlessly. 
And I have a lot to say about that, but it's super nerdy and probably boring. But there is a logic to it. There is that could be a road we could go down. I, I, I feel like it's yeah, probably like, yeah. I don't, I don't even know. know. Yeah. Just a little bit of practice, yeah. practice nerd time. Think about it, and I'll try to express it in a way that's not boring. Um, okay, I can tell you this. This is my latest thing with a metronome, and I think I've sort of been pointing towards it my whole metronome life, which is probably like I don't know, the last 20 years maybe. I've spent in little rooms with a click. While other people were out enjoying themselves. Um, check it out. I spent a lot of time trying to sync my internal clock, okay, my sense of where the beat is, with the metronome. Like, I thought that's what the metronome was doing for me. I thought it was teaching me or challenging me to sync my sense of where the click is with its sense of where it is. And that if I could somehow achieve unity with that, then I would have good time. And after doing that, like really, really, as hard as I could, and concentrating on it as much as I could, doing it as often as I could, I would still find myself listening back to like a record or something that I played on, and there would be this phrase that was super rushed. You know, it was out of the, out of the group. I was like, what is going on here? I just spent 10 years trying not to do that. And here I am with like really good players and instantly I hear it. Like as soon as I hear that phrase, it's obvious that it's rush. It's obviously wrong. And I couldn't figure it out. You know, I mean, first instinct, I'm not good. You know, it's some problem I have. My time isn't as good as I thought it was or would like it to be. But, but what I realized, long story short, is the metronome is not there for you to sink to. It's there to instruct you, beat by beat, where to put your idea. There's a difference. The metronome, click by click, is instructing you about where to put it in the group. And if you're listening to it as if you're deferring your clock, your sense of right and wrong, to it, you will play in its pocket if you can respond to it as a musician, which we do, you know. And what you're doing when you're doing that is you're practicing doing that with drummers. You're practicing doing that with any external source. Like, your ability to play in the groove is, is your ability to listen to what the groove is around you. Not listen to your own sense of one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, you know, as the drummer is like a quarter note or a half or eight, sixteen, dot an eighth note away from that. Like, you have to listen to what they're doing and base what you do completely on that. And forget about your internal clock. Your internal clock is for when you play alone. That's when you've got to have an internal clock. And, and listening to a click for 20 years will kind of eventually get into your head and eventually you probably have a reasonably good idea of where the click is inside. Um, and drummers, to a large degree, do that all the time. Although good drummers play in good bands, they listen to the outside too. They're not generating everything 100%. But some drummers do have to do that. And so they're relying on their internal clock. And then we rely on them. Are they metronomes? No. No, they're people that fluctuate. So for us to sound like we're in the pocket, we have to fluctuate right along with them. This was confirmed, like, I, I seriously got this into my head, and I was like, holy cow, this is amazing. Like, you, you can't stop listening to that thing. And the guys that I know that have really good time, the, the amazing people, the immortals, you can see them. They listen constantly to what's going on around them, groove-wise, and they're placing their notes based on that. Now, this was confirmed, too, when I, when I saw this really cool thing uh, that Paul McCartney did, some video he did, you know, for some advertising something, you know, Toyota or whatever it was, and they were, at, they were asking, like, did you use a click track with the Beatles? And he was like, oh, no, we didn't have that then. You know, we just listened to the drums. He said, you know, Rico had good time, so we were lucky. But, you know, if he slowed down on a track, we all just slowed down with him. Answer. 
they, they, they're not like thinking to themselves, no Ringo, no, it's here. You know, so you got these two different time fields happening in the same track, you know, and so, and that's why I want to hold your hand doesn't groove. I mean, come on. So it's just that, it's just the listening thing. And, uh, that's that's a big part of the procedure. Awesome. In terms of the weirdness stuff, like the displacement and all that, 